Cool. Uh, sorry about that. We got disconnected there for a second. Um, but I believe that now everything should be copacetic. So, yes, say hello. My name's Rich Sheffrin. Do these twice a week, and I do these so that I can primarily help entrepreneurs and marketers like you uh, grow your business and get the best advice that you can from someone who's been there and done that, uh, not someone that's on some floor of some coaching uh, telephone selling place that is going to give you not the best advice by someone who hasn't done it or helped other people do it. So, um, so that's me in a nutshell. And um, what we started talking about on Tuesday was something that actually I had mentioned the week before, which is that my favorite type of marketing to do is doing a launch. And my favorite type of launch to do is to do it in real time. In other words, not the four video approach that has become very popular over the years, but prior to that four video approach coming out, it used to be much more of entering into a conversation with the marketplace, knowing the trajectory or the end result of where you wanted to take people, but not knowing necessarily how you were going to get them there because it would be the same as kind of mapping out a uh, conversation without knowing what the other side was going to say and not letting that stop you from writing your next uh, line. You couldn't do it or it wouldn't come out well. And so in the past, when like in 2006, seven and eight, when Jeff Walker first kind of introduced the world to product launch formula, uh, most launches were done the way I'm talking about. They were much more dynamic. It was much more of like, it wasn't all planned out in sequence. It was much more like, okay, I have this thing to sell. I know what I want to sell. And uh, I'm going to start the conversation where people are, and then we'll just see how we take them there. And so uh, that was kind of my favorite way. That is still to this day, my favorite type of marketing uh, to do because you really are entering into a conversation with a group of people and it's exciting and fun to wake up each morning and to look at like what the feedback was from the day before of all the conversations that were started, the content that you had put out, et cetera. And then to figure out like, okay, what do we do today to move people closer to buying tomorrow than they are today? Right. And so it made it for a lot of fun. And, uh, I just got done. So yeah, so today was a lot of different calls. And also, um, for those of you who I did this presentation, not today, but yesterday, uh, for ACS, um, and it's strike points, uh, event that they have strike point media. And, uh, I did a presentation that actually probably going to do one more time to kind of really tighten it a little bit. But, uh, I, it was something that I shared last week um, with a Jay Abraham group because uh, Jay had asked me to speak to one of his groups. And I was really talking about like how Agora works, why I started Steal Our Winners and why I thought it was such a great product from a marketing pro side, not like the quality of what we provide um, our subscribers, but from a business standpoint, the idea that every piece of our deliverables in Steal Our Winners could actually be a premium that helps us sell it and how powerful of an approach that is. And so that was when I was talking to Jay's group. And then this time, as I was talking to Jeremy Blossom's Strike Point Media's group, right, um, I added to it where I added like, 10 of the 10 elements that I think make up the ideal front end product. And I'd never seen anyone kind of distill down what makes the perfect front end product. And, uh, and so that was kind of cool. And that was what I did yesterday. And then I had back to back calls. And then today I had back to back calls and I just finished a steal our winners interview with Franco, um, who I had interviewed last month for steal our winners when uh sean ellis had told me that he oh not sean ellis sean kemp uh had told me about this guy that had closed that did an event and he had 24 people in the event and he sold 23 of them uh an eighteen thousand dollar program so a 90 some odd percent close rate and 
before we did the interview last month, um, you know, whenever I'm interviewing someone brand new that I don't know, I like to talk to them first to one, make sure that what they're going to say is valuable t- for my clients and two, to just get a sense of who they are and, you know, uh, get a better understanding of where, what they're sharing fits into their business and everything else. And it was interesting because when I was talking to him, uh, you know, he had this great kind of result of selling 23 out of 24. But then as I was talking to him, what he told me made me even more curious because he ended up all of those people that ended up at that event that paid him that money had paid him a bunch of money before and they were all uh, acquired at zero cost that his method for acquiring those customers did not require advertising. So I found that fascinating. And so we ended up making it a two part interview where last month's interview was about how he got those clients. And then this interview was how did he have an event that was so successful with those clients? And so really blown away by Franco. I think, uh, Franco is someone that as someone who has coached a lot of people and has, uh, talk to a lot of people in our space for the last two decades. Um, I told Franco this on, as we ended the interview, he's going far. Um, I would imagine that he will become a much bigger deal over the next couple of years. It's not to say that he's not a big deal now, but I would say most people don't know him. And I would imagine more people will know him over the years to come. Uh, the interview went an hour and a half, which is the longest one I've done for steal our winners. And it wasn't, uh, about, uh, it was not, uh, because I was busy talking most of the time. So let's see who's with us. Uh, what we didn't get as far, we didn't get that far in covering the points on the whiteboard, um, that we started last week. I mean, last call. So last call, last live stream. Uh, so I assume that's what we're going to be doing today and we'll just pick up where we left off. Um, and huh. So with that said, let's see who's joined us. And, uh, as always, uh, comment, emote, and most importantly, share. You can do any of those three and do all of those three as often as you you would like. And, uh, the more you do that, the more I appreciate it and therefore appreciate you. And I always look at who shares. I I can promise you that. And I look at who emotes and I look at the comments afterwards, in addition to going back and forth with you guys. Um, the also please ask me whatever questions you have. Um, because it's always better as a dialogue as opposed to a monologue. So let's see who's with us. Uh, hey, John C. Claire, good to see you in Pennsylvania and glad to know that I'm loud. Uh, hey, Jason in Tampa and Luis, good to see you, my friend. Luis, you're in Mexico, right? Is that where you are? I think so. Uh, Dave, good to see you in Mobile, Alabama. What is CCIM? What does that mean? Uh, not sure. Is that like a designation? Uh, Greetings from Coronado Island. Shared to two of my pages today. Well, then, Dr. Rolgeman, you rock. Uh, Hey, Hugo, good to see you in Miami. And Lisa in Miami as well. Uh, Aren't you guys glad that we live in Florida and are not busy with another lockdown like it seems like the rest of the world is going to? I really hope that doesn't happen here. And I think DeSantis will hold the line, hopefully. Uh, Hey, Glenn, good to see you again from Highland Beach. So we're all of us Florida people. I've got Hugo and Lisa to the south of me, and I've got Glenn to the north of me, right? Is Highland a little bit north? I think it is, right? Um, Or is it between Boca and Delray just on the ocean side? I don't remember. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Uh, And Kayvon in Vancouver. And Mark, good to see you. And Matt from England, good to see you. And Chris Hanlon from New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, I like New Zealand. Uh, Tom, nice 
to see you in from Connecticut and never bored with your board. <laughs> um, I want a magic bullet, Rich, please. Okay, well, what kind of magic bullet would you like? Um, as I watch all these live streams, I'm thinking, Rich, uh, seems like such a nice guy. How the hell was he so successful in the cutthroat New York City fashion garment center music industries, not to mention online marketing, but last live stream and some rants about the copywriter who crossed him. I got a flash of the killer inside. It's there when needed. Now it all makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm well, you know, Leon, I'm also I'm kind of a sweetheart and a pushover until I'm not. And, and it takes a lot for me not to be that way, for me to be different than what, like the nice guy. And part of it probably to a detriment, but um, you know, I've never kind of hidden the fact that my dad was a ruthless business guy. He was a sociopath uh, and I know this, well, he was a sociopath period. And I watched him screw over a lot of people uh, in my life uh, never thought he would screw me, but when he had the opportunity, like the scorpion with the frog, uh, he screwed me. And um, and so I think part of it takes a lot for me to, to kind of release the Kraken, so to speak, um, because I never wanted to be like that. And so probably to a fault, um, I try not to be, which sometimes puts myself at a disadvantage, but it's worked out okay. Um, uh, yes. Okay. I don't know what you're saying. Yes to Carlos. Oh, uh, Mexico. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, Boynton beach here. Wow. We have such a Florida contingent here. So, wow. So we have Highland beach, Boynton beach, Miami. Like, uh, it sounds like we should just have a Florida party at some point. Um, and just got to pick a place. Uh, Steal this winner, Rich. Be a participant, not a spectator. Oh, I like that. Yeah. for That's what Mark said. Be a participant, not a spectator. Um, South. Okay, so it is between Del Rey and Boca. You know, uh, Gordon Ramsay did a, I think, a season or at least a couple shows down in Highland Beach with some of the restaurants for Kitchen Nightmares, I think. Uh, yes, happy I'm here. Yeah. I love, like... I, um, so Kim, my girlfriend right now is in New York and, um, you know, working on her apartment there. And then tonight I think she's going to her Hamptons house. Um, but, uh, the sooner she can get out of there, the better. And she was showing me the prices to come to New York from Florida was like, you could take a jet blue flight for like 25 bucks because who wants to go to New York right now? Um, you know, not me, that's for sure. Uh, da, 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 da. shout out from California. We're on lockdown and 10 PM curfew now. Crazy, right? Walter. Um, it's just crazy. Uh, I don't want to go down that path again tonight, but man, I just, uh, I, we're going, I, I, you, well, it seems as if we're going to another complete lockdown. Uh, it looks like Biden wants to do a six week national one i hope republican governors tell him to go go screw himself uh because a six-week lockdown will destroy so much of this economy uh hey denise happy thursday to you and next thursday is thanksgiving so um i guess we won't be doing a live stream then um well you guys let me know um and i would not be offended at all but if I were to do a live stream next Thursday, my assumption is that no one would be here. And so there's absolutely no reason to be doing it because that's the day that most people spend with their family. Um, so let me know if you would tune into a live stream at this time next Thursday. Um, if enough of you say that you would, maybe I'll do it. But uh, my plan right now is not. Um, and uh, I wish that my daughter, who was up in the Hamptons right now, wanted to come back down to Florida. But the problem with having your daughter go to high school in New York is now all her friends are in New York. And so she doesn't want to come down to Florida. And so hopefully she changes her mind. But she said she's going to come down for Christmas, but for not 
for Thanksgiving. Um, hello, Chris from Bonita, California. And I guess that's a neighbor of Dr. Vogelman in Coronado Beach. Uh, Matt Tarrant, question from Tuesday. If marketing means setting beliefs and sales means pushing people out of their status quo, what would a Peter Drucker, the job of marketing is to make selling superfluous marketing campaign look like? Like a paradigm shift that instantly shifts the ground from under people? Examples? Well, okay, so if, um, just to give you a quick uh, explanation, uh, Matt, but you can feel free to pepper me with questions after. Um, you know, that's where the core concept comes in, right? So, you know, the core concept, and if you're not familiar with that, uh, I posted the video that I did for the uh, marketing equivalent of TED uh, that used to be put on called SAM, um, where I did a 20 minute video on the core concept, which I also wrote a report on, but that's where the core concept comes in. It's the single belief that if someone believes it, like the default option is your USP. So my core concept was for like the internet business manifesto or the um, webinar for BGS that opportunity seekers struggle and fail, strategic entrepreneurs succeed and do so e more easily than, you know, and do it in a way that they work less than a uh, opportunity seeker. So if I, if, if you buy into that, like I've convinced you, you like that, you, you're like, of course, and then you believe that you're a opportunity seeker and the BGS program is the only program that even says, even makes the claim that it transforms opportunity seekers into strategic entrepreneurs, then selling is superfluous at that point. You're an opportunity seeker. You want to have a successful business. You know that opportunity seekers fail. Um, there's only one program that turns opportunity seekers into strategic entrepreneurs. And you know that you've seen the proof of the success that that program has had. Hence, selling is superfluous. Or like in the entrepreneurial emergency, if I convince you that um, your results, your current results are more a function of what constrains you from your potential than your potential itself. And that the reason that you haven't gotten the results that you wanted was because you've been spending a lot more time adding more potential and not enough time removing the constraints that tap, that prevent you from tapping into that potential. And there's only one program that teaches you to identify what those constraints are and how to eliminate them. Then once again, the selling is somewhat superfluous. So that's what I mean by, you know, if I'm establishing the beliefs, uh, then kicking someone out of status quo is relatively easy. If the beliefs are strong enough, I don't even have to do anything. It's superfluous. But if I do remember what I said about kicking someone out of status quo, it, there can be many reasons why someone gets pushed out of status quo. The pain could become more intense, right? Like I gained more weight and now I'm 220 and I'm afraid I'm going to be 250. I'm going on a diet. I'm not eating any chocolate. If or there could be a new way to get that outcome, like all of a sudden it's easier, right? Or if I've convinced you that BGS, like, you know, in my example earlier about opportunity seekers and stuff like that, and right now is the only opportunity you might ever have to be personally coached by me actually taking you through it, that would be a reason to get you out of status quo. Um, so there are many other things other than just making the sale or trying to make the sale that can push someone out of status quo, that the pain gets worse, that this getting the solution, there's a new way or an easier way to get to the solution, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So don't think that a lot of times, once you have the beliefs in place, you might not have to do any selling and people are actually saying to you, like, I want to buy from you. Will you sell me already? And so uh, hopefully, Matt, that answers the question. Uh, Sounds like you have a slow burning fuse. Um, I guess it depends who you ask, right? Uh, there are certain people that that fuse is very short, but, um, well, I'm an overthinker to a detriment, right? And so when someone overthinks, you know, it's like when I went to my, uh, one of my, well, my therapist, I was gonna say one of my therapists, like I have many, but over the, I don't have any therapists 
I haven't had a therapist recently or over the last couple of years, but I've had numerous over the many years. Uh, and my last therapist, uh, she, like I asked her about like cognitive behavioral therapy and I was interested in that. And she was like, oh, that's so not what you need. Um, she's like, that's what you do in your journal all the time. You're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. You're looking at what people have said to you and you're trying to look at like, did you distort what they were saying? Did you overgeneralize, you know, all these different things and how could you see it differently? She's like, the last thing you need to do is do more of that. Um, you need to do more like getting in touch with your body, your emotions, things of that nature. So, um, why am I sharing that? I'm sharing that because. I think like I have a short fuse because more often than not, I can see how the other person might think they're completely right, even though if I think they're completely wrong. Um, and so it's only when I have exhausted all other possibilities and my only that my only conclusion is, uh, no, that's who you are as a person, uh, that, uh, that like, yeah, it releases the, uh, uh, thing. Uh, wow. That's a big share about your dad. Thanks for disclosing. Yeah. It, yeah, I have a interesting background, but that was traumatic, especially getting screwed by my dad when we just had our first baby and I had to sell everything because I got screwed by my dad. Uh, I'm actually from New Smyrna, Florida, just got just up here in Connecticut getting, uh, repaired by the VA, the frozen North right now, looking forward to this. Thanks in advance. Oh, cool. Well, glad to have you, Tom. And thanks for serving our country. Uh, cold near frozen tundra of central Illinois here. Yeah, I can only imagine. You know, Ron, um, I don't know how close you are to Chicago, but um, I I was reviewing some stuff that I read years ago uh, by this, and I I'm, I'm gonna I plan on re-reviewing some of it because I really enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed it the first time I came across the stuff. Um, there's a, there's a transformation company out there that seems to do a lot of things, right? Um, the name of the company is the right Institute, like W R I G H T. Uh, it's, I don't know these people. I've just read a lot of their stuff, bought some of their stuff. Um, Judith Wright and Robert, uh, Wright, both doctors, both PhDs. Um, and they have a really interesting program that really combines, a lot of things I'm interested in. So transformation with existential philosophy like Sartre, Nietzsche, uh, Kierkegaard, and Heidegger. And then the psychology of Alfred Adler as opposed to Freud, right? One is more future focused, one is more past focused, Freud being more past. Um, and conceptually it's very powerful and so anyway if you ever get the chance check out the right institute that's what i was saying ron uh i met gordon ramsay in his chelsea restaurant oh very cool man i used to live in chelsea manhattan but that's a totally different chelsea um Vilio, how's it going sir richard hello from miami wow you know it's so weird right like that uh we have all these people from all around the world and um not a crazy number i'm sure but uh, and yet such a good portion of the people here are from Florida. You know, right now there's not even that many people on there's 36, uh, and I'd say at least eight of them seem to be from Florida. So interesting. Um, 10 PM curfew is no big deal. After all, nothing good ever happens after midnight. Well, it all depends, right? Like, um, I tell you that I'm most productive, cr uh, Christopher, when I am going to bed by 10, getting up at like four or five, because what I'm going to get done at four or five to six or seven is so much more than I'm going to get done from 10 to 12. But, you know, um, it's obvious that if anything, it's that with COVID has been every time we give an inch, they take a mile. Right. So, yeah, it's first first like in New York. Right. First, they did the curfew again. Now they just closed all the public schools like it's only a matter of time until the next thing. And, you know, this whole thing started when they told us 
all they needed to do was flatten the curve and that would only take 15 days and now it's nine months later and uh, still dealing with this crap. So I don't trust the government and I don't like the government impinging on any of my rights. I think it's insane that they're telling people what they can do and what they can't do like for Thanksgiving. Like I will have whoever I want over my house and I am not, unless someone's got a warrant, they're not coming into my house to check how many people I have in my house. Uh, this is still America. <laughs> um, never assume I would tune in during my food coma. Uh, funny. Oh, someone's calling me, my daughter. And if my daughter knew better, uh, if my daughter knew better, she would know that I'm on a live stream right now. And I, um, answered that to tell her that. Um, all right. That's, and that call. And uh, let's see. Yep, no Thanksgiving in New Zealand. Ah, oh, that's true. Uh, Wrapped is such an amazing book. Any other books about attention or intention? Uh, thank you. And Miyuki, I can't tell by the picture, but are you Mickey from like the Mickey I know in Japan that works with Hero, or are you? Someone totally different. I do have another book, though, that I could recommend. I pulled it out of my library. Um, I haven't had a chance to review it yet, but um, this book is called Attention. And it's written by Saccharin. S-A-C-H-A-R-I-N. I don't remember reading this book, but I did. I can tell because I must have not had a highlighter with me. And... Um, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but I've like marked it all up. And um, so here's the preface. Uh, I'll just read you like the first paragraph. This is a book about people's attention, how marketers can get it and how they can keep it. This book describes a new set of methods for gaining attention, a new mechanics for getting noticed. I call the approach attention mechanics. Now, I really don't remember whether this was a great book or not. Um, but I will, I do plan on reviewing what I highlighted here because it seems like I did a lot. Um, like I, I interacted with this quite a bit. Um, so anyway, that would be another good book. Um, Saccharin, I, I think the guy's, if I'm thinking correctly, his name is Ken Saccharin, but I could, yep. Ken Saccharin. So it's attention, how to interrupt, yell, whisper, and touch consumers by Ken Saccharin. But if you want to know if it's a good book or not, uh, ask me next week. I will have reviewed this. Uh, at the other books I grabbed from my library yesterday. Um, yeah, so let me know, Miyuki, if you're Mickey or if I'm just totally made that up in my head that you're the same person. I'll be here in England for you next Thursday. Okay, so uh, maybe... Maybe I will do it, but it won't be like I'll do it from like a chair <laughs> and it'll be more of a conversation and uh, I'll smoke a cigar and drink some scotch. Uh, who knows? Maybe even light a joint uh, since I prefer that over scotch these days. But um, we'll see where it takes us. Um, all right. Jane from D.C. I'd probably show up this time next Thursday. Well, that's good to know. Um I hope you're not trapped in D.C. I imagine D.C. will go on lockdown some point soon. Um, hope you're doing well, Jane. Uh, all the international crowd will be here because we don't celebrate Thanksgiving. Makes total sense. What up from Philly, Rich? What up, Dan Fishman? Oh, very cool. Good to see you, man. Uh, and Mark, hello from Indiana. Cool. Hi, Mark. Uh, maybe a little bit earlier on Thanksgiving. I'll be there if it's in the afternoon. Got it. Um, how much does BGS cost? Well, um, we don't really market it right now. Um, BGS is when I was marketing it and selling it, it doesn't mean you can't buy it right now. You would just have to contact us and tell them that you want to buy it. Cause I don't think there's a page even out there. Um, it is 3000 if you pay in full or, and I don't even know if we can do the drip method cause we turned off our platform. But when we used to drip it out, it was $400 a month and you just, you know, pay, pay as you go. Um, so you're not locked in, but, um, 
Hugo's been bugging me, and I'm going to be talking to Hugo next week anyway. About I got to put, I do have to get a coaching program out there. One of my favorite things to do is do coaching, and I'm good at it, and and I enjoy it a lot. And you know, more and more for me, um, it's well, you know, I tell you, like I, you know, I read this book last night, um, and it's. It's one of those books I didn't learn anything new, but it confirmed a lot of things that I believe in the way I live my life. So I, and sometimes books like that are good, especially, yeah, if you're not like heavy duty type reading. And it was a Dan Sullivan book, and I have a lot of respect for Dan. Um, and it was called The ABC Method or whatever. And basically, it's just all the things that you hate are A, the things that are eh, okay, like are Bs, and the things that fascinate you and excite you are Cs. And the goal is to make your life all C's. I look like that was on an angle. Um, all C's and no um, A's or B's. And um, coaching for me is one of those C things. I could do it all day long, every day, and I enjoy it. In fact, as long as I'm coaching the right people, I feel better after every call than I did before each call. And it's actually, when I used to do a lot of personal coaching, um, I would kick people out if, when I looked at the list of people I had to talk to that day, if the name, like, made my stomach turn, uh, I would kick that person out of my coaching program, give them a refund, and send them on their way because I did not enjoy talking to them. And also, there would be a price to pay by everyone else that day that I was talking to that person. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the core concept seems similar to Evaldo Albuquerque's 16 word sales letter, new opportunity times desire times mechanism. The mechanism is the only way to achieve the desire. Well, Evaldo worked with me. If you looked at the 16 word sales letter and it depends on when you got that, he thanked Russell for the one belief thing. But then he changed it because I called Russell and asked Russell where he learned it from. And he said me in front of Evaldo so that Evaldo would change it. Um, also, a lot of the stuff that's in like expert secrets came from uh, Dagan Smith. Uh, Russell thanks Dagan at the beginning of expert secrets. Dagan was a student of mine who went through the report writing workshop and stuff like that. That So a lot of the stuff that I've taught is in expert secrets, is in like Evaldo's book. Um, you know, uh, it's news to me how many people teach the chain of beliefs now when Kenrick Cleveland and I developed that back in 2008. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the, uh, just know that the core concept came out about 15 years before Ivaldo wrote his book. And that's not saying anything about Ivaldo. I mean, Ivaldo is a close friend of mine. In fact, we went out for dinner last week. Uh, and yeah, one of the best copywriters throughout Agora. And, uh, um, but I don't know. Uh, so that would make sense. Uh, Ivaldo and I worked in the same division in Agora for quite a while until I left and he left. Uh, he's more freelancer of all of Agora as opposed to just with one division in Agora Financial. And I used to be in that same division in Agora Financial. Now I'm more of a floater around as well. Um, okay, I'm glad you're Egyptian, but I don't know what your name is. So can you write your name out so that I can actually pronounce it? Because I cannot read uh, whatever you would... Egyptian, I guess? Um so, yes. Uh, awesome answer. Thanks. Cool. Hey, Cam Fats. Uh, thanks for putting these on, man. You help a lot of people, and we appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you, Cam. Um, and once again, sorry if I put you in a panic. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the format of your sales letter. I didn't have any problem with anything that you said there. Um, hey, Rich, tuning in from Quebec. Thanks for the entrepreneurial insights. Cool. Love my Canadians. In fact, my ex-wife uh, is Canadian, and... Uh, her boyfriend's in town right now, who's also Canadian. Got a chance to meet him. And, uh, yeah, Canada's always been a good thing. Um, although you Canadians are even more paranoid, it seems like, at least in certain places, more paranoid about uh, COVID than it sounds like here. When my ex went home to visit her family, uh, many of her family members wouldn't see her, even though she was there for a month. Like, um 
crazy. Um, Jordan Molson, born and raised in Florida, now in North Tennessee, finally. Uh, I guess it depends on where you were born and raised in Florida. I could understand that completely in certain parts of Florida. Uh, I find I'm most productive from 4 to 7 a.m. Yeah, um, certainly is. It's always great to do, be working when everyone else is sleeping because uh, it really kind of cuts out a lot of distractions. Um, so I agree, Dave. Um, John Sinclair, PA schools closed again too. So is Maryland. It's fucking nuts. I agree wholeheartedly, sir. Yeah, I, I think what they're doing to kids is the biggest crock of shit. And I think that it's totally, my mom was a teacher, so I can say this, I, I think, totally just to protect the, the teachers union, which has way too much power, which is the whole reason why school choice doesn't exist because they don't want to mess, they don't want to, the teachers union votes Democrat and Democrats are against school choice, which makes absolutely no sense. Because, like, everyone should have that choice to, to use the money to either go to private school or public school to get the best education they can because education really is the pathway out of poverty. And to have all these schools be closed and where it's been proven time and time again that uh, kids from underprivileged backgrounds do even worse in online education environments than wealthier kids were just putting disadvantaged people at more of a disadvantage. And uh, children are more likely to die from the flu than they are from COVID, and yet we don't close the schools for the flu. So why are we closing schools? We're closing the schools to protect teachers. So I guess in whoever's logic this is, that while a grocery, like a cashier, is someone whose job is indispensable, uh, and has to go to work during the, all of the COVID crisis, a school teacher is not indispensable at all. They don't have to. Like, why don't teachers who are worried about getting COVID quit? Because it is an indispensable job so that our kids can go to school and get an education. That's the way I look at it. I know a lot of people might disagree with me. I think it's absurd. I think it's absurd that my daughter didn't get to have her prom or her graduation from high school. And for what reason? because kids don't die from COVID. Uh, it is so rare. Anyway, off that. Uh, smoke a cigar and gnaw on a turkey leg. I've never been a huge fan of turkey. Like, I mean, I, I'll eat it, but of all the meats out there, it's one of my least favorite. Um, I'll prepare my scotch. Very cool. Um, Hey, Rich, do you have an idea of what your coaching program would look like one-on-one -on -one group coaching and price range? You know, I was thinking about crowdsourcing that, and I don't know that I want to do that tonight because, like I've mentioned, I'm kind of fried but um, today. But, uh, you know, I know Hugo wants something. If you want something and a bunch of other people want something, if you guys want to tell me, like I said, not tonight, but um, I would uh, – I'd love to kind of go back and forth with you guys on it. I, you know, I do want to update BGS. Like, so one possibility would be to take a group of people through BGS and give people the option of whether they want to do that. Take everyone as a group, but then offer an option by, for some people at a higher price point, um, if they wanted to be personally coached by me as they're going through that process. The other thing though, that I, um, like when I, when I was exploring doing the scale thing, which I was really excited about, and then I just felt like it would take me too much off of Steal Our Winners, which I have a lot to do for. Um, one of the things that I really like, though, in the scale world, um, and when I say scale world, let me rephrase. Uh, one of the things I really like from incubators, because it's not really the scale world, like I don't want anyone to mistake this for what, other courses out there on scaling art because they're not um is that in some really good incubators if they're following the lean methodology every week they have to kind of like clarify which assumption in their model they're going to validate or invalidate and what they're going to do and what's the learning from it and then at the beginning of the next week you kind of go over that so it's very like it's very clear each week how we're moving this business forward. And there's something to that that I really like. Um, 
it cuts away at a lot of the BS. So I'd like to have a program that was much more like that, but, um, but I don't know what people are looking for these days. And um, I am in the process of getting a new assistant slash right-hand person like for me, not, you know, this has nothing to do with Matt, um, because I don't, I am very highly functional in certain ways and highly dysfunctional in other ways. And I really need a, like, a assistant slash something more than an assistant, almost like a person to call me to task because I can get lost in my own world all the time. And uh, I am like five times as productive with the right person next to me as I am alone. And that person doesn't have to know anything more than me. They just need to be assertive and be on the same page as me. Um, so just got done with a phone call earlier today with the person that I'm hoping is that person. I've made them an offer already. Um, so we will see, but that has, believe it or not, a big impact on like the timeline of the coaching program because my life gets in order, a lot better of an order uh, with that uh, right-hand person right next to me all the time. Uh, okay. My scotch is I'll Winnie, I'll drink one with you next week. Very cool. I just drink Jack Daniels, just whiskey. Uh, mine aren't that fancy. Uh, Russell credits to you also, sir, an expert secrets. I mean, I just started reading it. Oh, does he? I didn't know that. Cool. Maybe he updated it then. Awesome. Good to know. Russell's always giving me props, so he doesn't ever take his, like, I've never seen Russell take other people's ideas and call them his own. Hey, Manuel, good to see you in Washington. Uh, whoops. Thank you for the book recommendation, Rich. Unfortunately, I'm not your friend, Mickey. Hey, but my husband and I would love to meet you next time when you come to Japan. Oh, well, very cool. I'd love to meet you guys, too. Um, I Last time I was there, I was in uh, Osaka and Tokyo. I think those were the only two places I went this last time. Uh, hey, Rich, just listening to you for 10 minutes helped me give me an give me an epiphany. What is your view on psycho cybernetics and the most useful concepts from the book? Um, what I would I, I don't have anything bad to say about psych, cyber, psycho cybernetics. I guess um, by the time I was exposed to it, I was kind of well past it. I do believe that we have a self image that we kind of fall in line with. Um, that's for sure. I don't think there's anything to dispute about that. Um, but I would say that I know a lot of people who've gotten a lot more out of that book than myself, including Franco, who I was just interviewing. Um, so I'm a fan of it. It seems like, you know, but like a lot of the classical self-help stuff like psycho cybernetics or, um, think and grow rich or any of those I appreciate all of them. I got value out of them as well, but none of them blew my mind and none of them were like, oh my God, where was this thought my whole life? Now things will be different, that kind of thing. Uh, yes, true. They are paranoid in Canada here with restrictions and I agree with your perspective on a second lockdown, decimating small businesses for a 99.5 survival rate and of, and you got cut off. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely insane, guys. It just is. And we really, like, you know, the government has just been a disappointment. And that has, that's across the board. Across the board. That's not just a bash on Trump or anything. That's a bash on everyone. Um, everyone. And the way this whole thing has been handled. The average person that dies from COVID is past the life expectancy. And I don't understand why it's not those people's responsibility to quarantine. Why is it the rest of the world? Like, uh, more people, like, the World Health Organization already said 250 million people will die of starvation if they do another lockdown. Like, that's a lot more than 250,000 people in the U.S. that have died. There are certainly more than 250,000 entrepreneurs who have lost everything. And, that, and they're not past the age of 80 
and already on borrowed time. These are people in, who have invested their whole life into building something, and now it's gone. Children in school, like, we do not know the impact that this will have on kids. We have no idea the kids between the ages of 5 and 10 that have been robbed time with others, the kids their own age. We have no idea of the emotional and psychological impact that this will have on these kids who have already had to homeschool pretty much for a whole year. A whole year. Not, and that has nothing to say about the parents. Like I have talked to people who are, have three kids, have a two-bedroom house or a three-bedroom house, and all five of them are on Zoom. The dad works, the mother works, and now the three kids are homeschooling. It's insane. Um, but I think you guys all know this, and you don't need to tune in here for to hear me gripe. You can pretty much tune in anywhere for that. So um, I think we'll leave that where it is, and we'll get to the task at hand, which is to look at this board. Um, all right, so let me pull this up here. All right, I think I can just actually bear with me here for a second, guys, as I move stuff around, because maybe I can do this. And um, I'm going to change. I'm going to go to my, uh, my FaceTime camera for a second, because I want to see if I can, yeah, put this right on, put the uh, thing here. No, I can't. Oh, I thought I could. All right, can't do that. Oh, there we go. All right, there it is. All right, so I can do that. And can I pull it? Um, no, I can't. Okay, so that's at least, at least it's right there on camera. And then I can do this. I thought I could do this. No, all right. Um, oh, I could do this, right? Yeah, that's not going to work. Oh, because that's... All right. Never mind. Let's go back to me for a second. And then we'll do this. Sorry, guys. Just trying to figure out the best way to show you this. All right. Cool. And now let's see if I do this. Can you guys see that okay? Let me know if you guys can see that okay. And... Uh, Jaden says, thank you for your breakthrough advertising notes. You're quite welcome. I posted those in the um, Facebook group for those of you who are in it. Uh, you should have seen it as an announcement. So do you guys remember where we left off? I don't think we got very high uh, or very far in this. I need someone, though, to tell me because uh, I have no recollection Oh, God, guys. Um, so let's see. I am. Um, hmm. All right. Okay, you can see the whiteboard. So thank you, Jane. But can you tell me, does anyone remember where we left off? I remember talking about this changes everything. I'm pretty sure I spoke about possible to probable. You can't see it, Miyuki? Uh, is it that it's too small to be read or you can't see uh, possible to probable is where we left off? Okay. Uh, Miyuki, oh, you can see it. Okay, cool. All right, so yeah. Okay, so Jane sees the whiteboard. Miyuki can see it and possible to probable says Hugo. All right, cool. So peg high price point. So this is really interesting, and uh, I think I shared this one, but I'll share it really quickly. Um, this I learned from Jeff Walker, and it was during my very first launch that I was doing during the manifesto. Uh, he, he told me that if I kept referencing a price point, it didn't matter what that price point was, um, that it would still like kind of um, prime people and it would create a, like a point. And so 
I kept talking about how my program wasn't going to be $25,000, even though my partner, Jay Abraham, normally charges $25,000 even for a weekend event. But I'm not going to do that, you know, and even though I'm going to be coaching you for a lot longer than a weekend, it won't be $25,000. And the next email, like I said, it's not going to be $25,000. So I just kept throwing that number around, $25,000, saying it's not going to be $25,000. But just the fact of throwing around that big number over and over again, just it starts to sink in. And then a price way below that seems like a, a screaming bargain. So pegged to a high price. So. Basically, right, like any time I'm talking about something from my past and, uh, and you know, remember, like I'm looking at this whiteboard every day as we're doing the communication, I'm reminded that like, oh, in the story I'm telling, is there a big number that I can use just to throw it in there? Um, because more big numbers makes that number later on seem less, right? Uh, yep, it's like... Avella says like almost like a price anchor. Avelia says almost like a price anchor. It's not almost like it is, right? So that's perfect. All right, so um, that covers that. And so give the coaching vibe, right? So I think we also talked about this one. I think I talked about a couple of these really quickly now that I kind of uh, am thinking it through. But let me, let's me let talk about the coaching vibe. So, um, you know, most of the time, what I've marketed have been coaching programs, so that's been relatively easy. What I mean here by giving the coaching vibe, though, is making people feel like it's a coaching experience, even when it's not. And so when I've sold like a home study program, uh, we don't want to make people feel like they're buying a box of stuff. And I think I shared on a live stream recently that one of the things that I learned from Mark Ford, uh, Michael Masterson, uh, and this was, we, we haven't tested this in a long time, so I don't know that this would still hold, but um, you know, like it, for any kind of course or product or program, right? You write this great copy and the whole purpose of the copy is to set up a visual in the person's mind of where they're going to be, what life is going to be like, right? You're creating a picture. And, you know, it's the same thing with like when I'm selling my coaching program, when I was used to sell BGS, like I don't want even people to think about it as a coaching program. I want them to think about it as like what I'm offering you. Whoa, what just happened? Whoa, what just happened? Who is trying to call me? Sorry, guys. I'm going to answer this just because this call shouldn't even be going through. Um, yeah, I can't answer it on my... I can't answer it here. Um, the... Why did I lose this, though? I don't understand why that happened. There we go. Um, and once again. All right. So... When selling a box, right, we want people to feel like it's more than a box. So what I was saying was, uh, like, yeah, if I'm selling my coaching program, I don't want people to think of it as a coaching program. I want them to think of it as I'm offering them the opportunity to learn a skill that provides, more, like, complete freedom, more freedom than anything else that anyone can ever offer them, which is that it's the ability to take any idea, turn it into a business that ultimately you can get free of. Um, so it's really like what I'm offering you is freedom and financial security for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to do then is show them what the coaching platform looks like, because then that takes it away from that dream of what I'm really offering. So what, um, what Mark, what I learned from Mark was like, after you've done this long thing where you really set up this dream, do you really want to show them six CDs? and a workbook that then turns that dream into a totally like mundane thing. It's like, oh, it's six CDs in a workbook. Oh, I've bought that before and here I still am. Um, so the, giving the coaching vibe is the opposite of that, right? People might be buying just a box of stuff. What you want them to feel though is that this thing that they're buying is really going to walk them step by step by step. So, um, you know, I've even noticed it in language patterns, the way some people talk versus the way others. Like when I've noticed that when I'm struggling with someone, with, 
when I'm struggling with something and I'm asking someone for help, right? Like, can you explain this to me? Whatever. Uh, there's even a big difference in the way I feel if they say we versus you. So the more accurate is you. Like, here's what you need to do, right? You should do this. You should do this versus here's what we need to do. We should do this and then we need to do this. And even though the we part is kind of like BS, it still feels better when I hear that. Um, so let me just make sure that my daughter is not dying because she should know that I'm doing a live stream. You know, I'm, you know, I'm doing a live stream right now. Yes. Tuesdays, two to four, Thursdays, six to eight. And every time that you've called, you bump me off my thing. So I will call you when I'm done. I love you. Bye. Okay. Um, I think she just finished working out and she's proud. Uh, so that's why she called twice. Um, anyway, so yeah, so like the coaching vibe is about kind of keeping that visual of what people really want, uh, as opposed to making it as concrete, like, oh, no, there is no help. You're just going to get this box. It's up to you whether you rather open it and go through it and things like that. All right. So the next one is surface objections. And this is so important. So there are a bunch of objections. If you sell information products, there's a bunch of like objections that are pretty standard that you got to overcome, right? Like my situation isn't that bad. Uh, so I don't need it. My situation is hopeless. So this won't do enough for me. Um, uh, I don't believe you. Um, I don't, uh, you know, there's about 10 of them and I just haven't looked at anything recently, so it's not fresh in my mind, but there's about 10 of these objections that are pretty standard. Um, and those are just the standard ones though. And if you never surface objections, like then you don't know why, uh, you don't know all the other reasons why. Uh, you don't know all the reasons why someone might not buy. Uh, let's go back. I'm, I want to go back to that, like the surfacing of objections. Um, but let's see what I missed here. Uh-oh. Did my sound go out? Yeah, I think your sound went out when my daughter called. That's why I was calling her back so she wouldn't call again. Uh, totally agree with the letdown from the feeling of freedom and financial security. Uh, down to a box of DVDs. Cool. Uh, I figured it out. Weird. Left came, left and came back to no sound. Back now. Cool. Yeah, I think it was my daughter FaceTiming me, which doesn't even make any sense because right now I have this other app on called uh, Trip Something, uh, which blocks every connection except the connection I'm using so that um, – it's made for people who are like working on a train or a plane that they can shut off all internet connections except like their email or one thing. So, and I have it set to eCam right now. So like a FaceTime call should not be even coming through my computer, but who knows why. Of course, I would recommend Trip, uh, whatever the name is, but uh, it's hard for me to recommend it because I just bought it like two months ago and now uh, they came out with a new version because I just upgraded my Mac software and they want me to buy the new version. And I used the old version like three times. So I'm not very happy with them right now. Um, yeah, I would. Oh, I do have some really cool tools to share, though, with you guys. Um, maybe that'll be another live stream. Um, oh, OK. Mark says, reminds me when I was in the boat business, we test and found test drives, decrease sales, best conversions were on dry land in the showroom. They bought the fantasy of boating. Interesting. That is interesting. That's interesting to know, Mark. Interesting that getting on the boat would actually decrease conversion. Interesting. I would have never known that, nor would I have guessed that, but it makes sense. Um, sorry, was we better than you or the other way around? We was better if we're talking like in a conversation, like if you were asking me right now, like you had a problem in your business and, um, and you said like, here's my problem. Well, which answer would you like better? You need to do this. You need to do that. And then you need to do this. Or here's what we need to do. We need to get this done. Then we need to get that done. And then we need to, you know. Um, so 
for me, we has always landed on me better. This, but I'm talking about in conversation. Um, so um, that was more of a passing aside, right, than like a marketing tactic. But um, the, you know, who uses we really like well is Todd Brown. Like, if you listen to Todd respond to people, he uses we a lot. And it just sounds good. It feels good um, being on the receiving end of that. In fact, I'll tell you a flip side of that. And for any of you who are coaches, or even if you just help people, this will be valuable. Because um, I do do this quite frequently. What you might notice is, is that when people tell you about their problems, a lot of times they project them outward, right? I'll be like, and I, Chris, just, I'm not picking on you, but I'll be like, hey, Chris, what's the problem? And they'll be like, you know how when you do this and then this, and you know how, you know, then you and you do, and I'm, I'm like, no, this is your problem. This is not my problem. So now tell me that again, but say I instead of you because it's your problem. It's not my problem. And maybe part of your problem is, is you're not owning it. So go over, right? Um, the first time I ever heard that done was Jamie Smart, who used to teach like NLP and influence and now is, teaches clarity or whatever his thing is. I read the book. It was pretty good. Um, but uh, I found that to be so powerful. And I've done it a couple of times in coaching situations, but where someone keeps using the word you for their problem. And it's like, dude, own the problem. It's I. It's not you. It's not me. It's you. Right. So um uh, hopefully that makes sense. Daughters have magical powers to get through to their dads. Yeah, for sure. Um, two people I would do the absolute most for are my two daughters. Uh, Todd Brown is a master at the weight. Have you noticed that too, Christopher? Or are you just saying that because I said it? Or is that something that you actually noticed? Um, we does sound better. It sounds like we have a team to get the task accomplished versus my own. Exactly. Right? Exactly my point. Um, okay, so that's, uh, but so giving the coaching vibe, right? You don't want people feeling like they're buying a box and then, uh, you know, you're gone, right? You, they want to feel like I'm going to guide you step by step through the process, right? Uh, hey, April, good to see you too. So glad you're here. Uh, we works well in France. <laughs> Certainly does. Um, and you know that like, my sister lives in France, um, and so actually one of her daughters, one of my nieces is here at our house. Um, she goes to University of Wisconsin, and they, they've been shut down, so she's been taking all her classes here, and her mom wants her to come home so that uh, she can celebrate her dad's birthday, but she would prefer to just stay here because what's the point of going to France to be in Paris to be locked down there? Because uh, they're on lockdown now as well. Uh, uh, no, I have listened to him and carefully read his copy. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So surface objections is what we were talking about. And um, yeah, uh, unless you probe, you won't know why people are not, you won't know all the reasons why people don't buy. So a couple of things that I've done just to kind of share like different ways of getting at it, right? So after I wrote the manifesto, uh, <laughs> we're not even going to go into what I went into like last. I don't want to be that guy. Uh, so after I wrote the manifesto, I, uh, asked people on my blog, I think, I don't remember how I did it, but I asked people now that you know, this, tell me why, what will now stand in your way of being successful. And people gave me a lot of reasons. And so, uh, I very quickly, like a week and a half later or two weeks later, wrote the missing chapter, right? I wasn't even planning on writing that. And what I did with the missing chapter is took all, I took like the first 200 reasons that people gave me and put them onto a mind map and kind of figured out what was the deeper problem of all these problems. And then that's what the missing chapter was about. But you know, understand that when I ask, like, okay, if I have a coaching program that's based on the manifesto, right? And, well, the manifesto was based on the coaching program, right? Now the coaching program is not based on the manifesto. But, like, if 
I ask you, now that you know this, what's still going to stand in your way, and I don't address those things, then you don't necessarily think that my coaching program is going to get you there either. But if I say, now that you know this, what's still going to stand in your way, and you, you know, I get 200 reasons, and then I show people that of all those 200 reasons, there's one deeper reason that's causing all of these. And, uh, and then I show you that my program is the only program that deals with that deeper reason. I've just now handled a ton of objections and also kind of spun it. But so that's one example, right? Um, but I used my report, released it. And then I said, now knowing this, what's going to, what will prevent you from succeeding now that you know this? And they had a bunch of reasons. And if they're going to join my coaching program to be successful, it might be a good idea for me to know what's in their head of what they think is stopping them. So that was one way. But like another thing I've always done when I, on, especially in automated webinars was p build it. If you're going to do an automated webinar, right. And you never start with one, or you shouldn't, is you should start with a live webinar and you should do that live webinar enough times until you nail it and get the conversion rate the way you want it. But um, if you're gonna do an automated webinar, one of the things you, sh you should be building into the equation is continual improvement. Like why wouldn't you? And so one of the things that helps with continual improvement is a follow-up process, one that tries to sell the crap out of whatever you offered on the webinar, because my experience has been that you can basically get, uh, you can double the amount of sales that you get from the webinar in the follow-up, not, so if you sell 5% of the people who show up on the webinar, you will sell another 5% of those people who showed up on the webinar in the follow-up. In the follow -up. That's generally more or less the way it's always worked for me. And, uh, but after that follow-up campaign is done, before they're going into the next campaign, I always, tr not, well, always would be a strong word. More often than not, I would incentivize getting at the real reason why someone didn't buy and I would, offer, I would bribe them. Really sorry that you didn't buy. You, as you know, I work really hard to refine my marketing to make it as effective as possible. And if you're willing to tell me, uh, you know, if you're willing to write me a real answer as to why you didn't buy, I will read all the answers and any real answer, I will send you back this, right? And it might be two reports or something, something that of value, not something that is free or something. And um, like one of them was a product that I did that I only did internal launches for, except I think I also offered it to Todd's List once, um, D3. And D3 was my marketing, the way I market, right? Which is very different than the way most people market. And, um, and so one of the, in the, so in the follow-up sequence that after the selling sequence was done with a bribe to tell me the reason, uh, one of the things that like a lot of people told me was that they were confused about what the difference was between BGS, which is the business growth coaching program and D3, which is the marketing one. And these were all people who were in BGS, which if you were in BGS, you know that it's mostly all business building with one module on marketing specific, right? Uh, versus everything marketing in another program. So I would have never thought that that would be an objection or a point of confusion, but that's why asking is so important. And I, any way that you can surface objections is really valuable. And, you know, one way to do it is kind of the way I just explained with the reports, like now that you know this, what would still stand in your way of getting the results? And they're gonna tell you actually their self doubts or what missing knowledge they feel they have or other things, so that's valuable. Um, and is something that people like if you buy if you buy into what my beliefs are which i'm not asking you to do any longer than like the next 60 seconds but if you buy into my belief right that a market is made up of a group of people that share a conflict and that conflict is either a goal unattained or a problem unresolved and that most people didn't join the market yesterday so they are struggling to get the outcome and they have done things to try and get that outcome to resolve that conflict then people want to find a solution and or they wouldn't be in the market anymore 
And but that doesn't mean that they want to just buy anything. They want to buy the thing that's actually going to help them. And they have some beliefs about what they need in or, or in order to get that outcome. And therefore, you must surface and then eliminate those objections, right? And the eliminating of the objections is so much better done in content outside of the sales message than inside the sales message, right? So I, I kind of explain the eliminate objections by once you know what the objection is, like in with, you know, why won't you be successful after I wrote the manifesto, how I eliminated those objections was when one fell swoop, right? Um, you're not building a business around your strength. All these problems are caused by that, whether it's because you can't, um, you're not getting any traction. You've offered people a piece of your business to, to partner with you. And they said no, and a bunch of other reasons, right? And at that time, Believe it or not, I know it might sound crazy. No one else really was talking about that you should build a business around your strengths. The closest of that was probably strategic coach who did have unique ability. They were ahead of me because Dan's a lot older than me. Um, but uh, I think it was him and I, and we were the only two people that really were talking about how your business should be built around your strengths. So uh, when I wrote the missing chapter that was news to most people and most people have no, and then I made it clear that most people don't know what their strengths are. And at that point in time, there weren't very many options of how you discover your strengths. So, um, that would just made it another reason why you need to buy my program. I eliminated the objection and at the same time, just made a stronger reason, um, of why people needed to buy. Does that make sense? So let me know if that makes sense. And, uh, let me see, what uh what uh you guys are saying here april can you give another example of how you're addressing their objections uh with talking about the main objection i'm not sure i understand the question april and it could be because i'm just a little burnt but um but i'm not sure i don't know um yet uh Ask me another way, because I don't want to go down a tangent if it's not. Um, but if you ask me another way, April, I promise I will answer it. Um, oh, wow. This is going outside of the... Or is that just going... No. All right. I don't know. Like, okay, let's just... I did a webinar on Tuesday on a multifamily market demand and had 15 on, sold two at 247 and another one yesterday. I didn't have the sales slides. I just mentioned, if you want to attend the live workshop, I'll tell you about it. And Q&A was full of questions and got a 20% conversion so far with one more day left in the follow-up sequence. Small win, but I'll take it. Okay. Well, it's not... So, the so yeah. So, what's useful is the Q&A, right? What were all the questions? Which one of those questions are really objections hidden under that question? And can you, next time you do it, make sure that those questions don't happen because you're going to eliminate them up front? And then, uh, let's see if you say anything else. Um, got it. Um well, anytime you're making some sales, um, look, selling two out of 15 is, I know the price point isn't high, but it's an over a 10% sell through 10% on a webinar generally is pretty damn good. Um, I've seen numbers much higher, but I've also seen numbers way, way lower. And so, uh, yeah, you know, a, if you sold three now, that is a 20% conversion and 20% conversion is pretty solid. So, uh, feel good about that. Makes sense. I would, Jaden, I would eliminate the, so Jaden asks, um, how would I eliminate the objections through follow-up emails or texts or would you, or how would you approach this? I would eliminate the objections in every way possible. And I would do it in a way where ideally it's not, it doesn't look like I'm handling objections and ideally you're, you're eliminating objections before they even surface. 
that's important if you can do it because it's so much more it's so much more easily done to prevent an objection than to handle an objection and you prevent an objection by making that whatever they were going to say that was the objection irrelevant by you know by cutting it off at the pass I, I can't talk about this generally I could certainly talk about this specifically uh, and so if anyone has a specific like how would you handle an objection like this I could certainly kind of give you some thoughts off the top of my head uh, was your advice to build your business around your strengths contradictory to what you said about build the business around your weaknesses or to make your weaknesses irrelevant um, no not at all um, I think your business should be built around your strengths especially when starting out it, it like if it's not, I don't know what advantage you bring to the, t what, not you, Leon, but what anyone would bring to the table. And the making your strengths irrelevant, like outfoxing your flaws, um, that is not in conflict with uh, building a business around your strengths. I have some really good strengths and I have some really big flaws. And so the idea is, is to build a business where my flaws are completely irrelevant and my Strengths are incredibly relevant. And so um, one defines what I'm doing. The other one defines what I'm not doing and have to figure out a way for the business to work without me doing those things. Hopefully, Leon, that makes sense. I, it should. Um, I think you clarified it as I typed the question. Cool. All right. Well, don't let that prevent you from uh, asking it another way if you feel like I didn't or on your next question. All right. So um, community, I think community is pretty obvious and it's not, I would definitely not say that I'm like really good at this, um, nor has it been a main thrust of mine. Um, but selling people on joining a community is like, it's just another strong reason, right? Why uh, to get people to buy. And it is a trigger for many people. Uh, definitely not my strongest suit, for sure, as an introvert. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting for me, just uh, passing aside. So back in 2008, when I did um, the G this course, this coaching program called GPS, which was the course where I taught uh, theory of constraints, I... Uh, I delivered that program this was 2008 and i delivered it live i did it live streaming every day uh from my office i think it was from let's say 8 30 in the morning till 10 I, I don't remember what time but it was in the morning uh and then i would follow that up with a q a live stream right after and then another q a live stream like 10 hours later like at 8 p.m at night till whenever because i had people worldwide and theory of constraints is teaching someone theory of constraints is like teaching someone algebra. And if they don't, if they don't get lesson three, by the time you get to lesson five, they're completely confused. So I had to do those two Q and A's and, uh, yeah. So just though, I hope it's not lost on anyone like that. Yeah. We delivered a course live through live streaming over 12 years ago. Um, Nobody was doing stuff like that back then. Anyway, um, so you couldn't live stream on any platform other than Ustream, and obviously they weren't um, weren't going to be streaming on their platform if, if it's a multi-thousand dollar course. But one of the things that was really cool that I noticed was that, like, if you can imagine, every day at 8.30, let's just say it was then, I would go live and I'd be teaching and there would be a chat log like you see here in Facebook, I guess, but even better because it was on the side, not below, or I guess it depends on how you're watching this right now. And, um, and you could also private message people, etc. right? And so imagine tuning in here every day and, you know, it's limited to... Uh, there maybe were like 1500 people or 2000 people, or I don't remember how many people were in the program, but, um, but those people every day you're showing up with. And so like people made friends and you're going through stuff that's tough. So people are helping each other understand stuff. 
uh, I felt like two weeks in, I was blown away at the community that formed. And I really felt like, yeah, I still need to teach the course. Obviously, that's what people paid for. But everyone here, not everyone, but most people here have developed new friendships. And it's like this became part of their routine, that they showed up here every day. They talked to their friends every day. You know, it became like a, a place to hang out. Uh, you know, it's kind of cool, like free Facebook, I guess. But uh, this sense of community, like I felt like people would still show up every day, even if I wasn't teaching, because they had formed a community and they were friends. And they, like everyone was on this journey together to get their business where they wanted it to. And it was really powerful. And um, and I, there are certainly a lot of other people that you could look at who have definitely sold community a lot better than I have ever or even could dream of doing it. So I don't feel like I really have a lot to add on it, um, but uh, um, but it certainly is a more important piece today than ever. Uh, I would have said that last year. I am doubly saying that this year. Uh, community is even more important as more people are isolated. Um, you know, something I learned early on, like with... Um, you know, most of you know, like I owned hypnosis centers. I'm a trained hypnotherapist, went through NLP training, all that kind of stuff. And uh, but one of the things as someone who's been the victim of, of trauma, um, in fact, though, I'm very fortunate that like a lot of the things that trauma has done for me have actually been beneficial. I'm sure I've also paid a price in many ways. Um, but people often ask me, uh, and how I'm able to go like long periods of time without sleep or not eat or whatever. Cause like, that's always been easy for me. Well, it, a lot of things are easy when you're not connected to your body. So if you're, if you don't get the signals from your body that you're tired or you're hungry, it's really easy not to eat or to not go to sleep and be able to go long periods of time, right? Being disassociated from your body is one of the side effects of trauma. Um, anyway, uh, but I learned this early on that, you know, all trauma happens in relationship. People don't experience trauma by themselves, right? Uh, you know, not physical, maybe physical trauma, <laughs> uh, but mental trauma, there has to be another person involved. And so all trauma is caused in relationship and the natural reaction to trauma is to isolate, to pull oneself out and to isolate oneself, which is the worst possible thing that someone can do who's experienced trauma. Because not only is all trauma caused in relationship, the only way trauma disappears is in relationship too. Not necessarily and generally not the same people, but you only overcome trauma with people just like the only way you get trauma is with people. And so this whole COVID thing uh, just makes the need for community that much more, right? Like there's that much bigger of a reason. And, you know, from a business standpoint, I might like benefit now from lockdowns because now I've been doing these live streams. The reason I even started these live streams was because of the lockdown and that I needed a way to just talk to people like you guys because uh, I don't do well, even though I'm an introvert, being too isolated. And uh, and now that I've gotten this experience, and I mean, I think I'm getting better over time just doing these because, you know, with practice, you get better. Uh, if we get into another lockdown again, I'm sure like I get a lot more viewers and maybe I would adjust the times and stuff like that because uh, people would have less choices again. Uh, they'd, ha they'd be stuck at home, but I just don't. I think community is incredibly important. I wish I could give you more strategies for it, but I'm just not, it's not my, it's not my forte um, at all. Uh, we're gonna put in this in. Okay, so the next one, I'm gonna go past the push button tool because that's also never been my strong suit. Um, but, you know, this was during a launch. And so can we put in a push button tool like most of the big launches have delivered some kind of tool to make it seem easier to make it uh you know to be a focal point etc but this next one i love this one is not mine at all but um it's an it's a it's a scarcity and urgency play and 
what I have written out is actually the first time that I ever saw it, which was from John Reese. So props to John. Uh, so in Traffic Secrets, so Traffic Secrets was based on an event that I was at. Um, and, and so I don't remember what the event cost. I think it was a couple thousand bucks or whatever. And it was in Orlando. And, um, and he taught in one of the sessions outsourcing. And I think he recommended like two or three places to go for, to find out sourcers. Uh, and, uh, and then in, and he turned that seminar, you know, into a home study program. Right. And, and this was genius because John is genius. And, um, so John in the pitch for traffic secrets said he made a mistake, right? So I'll just channel John here and be forgiving if I'm getting some of the verbiage wrong, because this is over 15 years ago. But um, he said something along the lines that, as you know, Traffic Secrets was recorded at this live event for people who've spent a lot more, more money than what Traffic Secrets cost. At that event, I revealed the three places where I find the best people to outsource to. Um, that should have never made it into the Traffic Secrets course, because the more people that find out about this, the less easy or the more difficult it will be for the people who paid me to be at this event uh, to really be able to get the best of the best from these uh, outsourcing places. Um, so recognizing that, um, the first thousand units of Traffic Secrets have already been produced. That DVD is in the course. Uh, the next go around, when I have to reorder more quantity, I'm taking that DVD out. We're not making any more copies of it. So um, if your part, uh, if your number, if your order 1001, that DVD will not be included. And that made total sense from a rationale as to why he was pulling it out, made total sense. Uh, gave you a reason why there was scarcity on a product that was not going to be taken off the market anytime soon, but now there was scarcity for those first thousand purchases to happen. That scarcity then creates an urgency of needing to get it before those thousand happen. So I love that, right? And if you saw what I did where I did a cut to the front of the line pass, um, it had this similar effect, right? So let me share this with you quickly, then I'll go back to the questions and then we'll see where we're at. Um, so, you know, I wrote, uh, I wrote the manifesto hoping to get like a dozen clients, what have you. I ended up getting thousands upon thousands, but before, between those two points in time, uh, the manifesto went viral, right? Now, the manifesto was being downloaded a ridiculous amount of times. My uh, strategic profit at that time was in the top 500 Alexa sites worldwide, um, beating Wimbledon during Wimbledon. And uh, it was kind of insane, right? And literally, I, I kid you not, it might be hard to imagine this, but um, there used to be something called Google blog search. I don't even think that exists anymore. Every time I hit refresh, there was another article or another write up about me and it didn't matter. I could just like keep hitting it and that got really addictive for about a month or two. Uh, then it got born. Uh, but, uh, during that month or two, uh, to go from unknown to known, it was kind of cool. But, um, the, where the hell was I just going with this? Uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, what was I just, holy crap. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Now I remember. So I was telling you about like, uh, this urgency scarcity play, like regret putting this in, I'm going to have to take it out kind of thing. Um, so this turned out like a lot of things I've done, things that I was just doing for one reason that turned out to be genius for some other reason. Right. Um, so this was another play that I did because I was insecure and unsure that in hindsight turned out to be genius, not because I was insecure and unsure, but because of what happened. So I was talking to Jeff Walker and I was telling him that I was concerned because I had no idea 
how many people were downloading the manifesto, reading the manifesto, writing about the manifesto um, because of the manifesto and had no interest in coaching or business coaching or being coached by me or anything else. And um, the um, and so Jeff had, I think it was Jeff's idea. Um, and, uh, Jason Potash, I think that was his name out in Canada had just developed this script of a, for a page using Ajax, which was a brand new programming language back in like 2006, which allowed for the page to continually be refreshed like on its own which meant that things could be updated on the page in real time. And so what we did was this, and we did this because I wanted to get some idea, like, am I really going to be able to sell this coaching program or did I just create the most popular free report online? And um, so what we created was a cut to the front of the line pass, right? And the idea behind it was, that okay, like in the last two, three weeks, we've already had 35,000 people because the numbers just kept growing, right? Um, had a million people in the first two plus years and then two million people like five years in, six years in, and then we stopped counting, but uh, that many downloads. But um, the, so at that time, there were about 35,000 people who had opted in and, uh, and, there were two components to this launch. The first launch was me selling private coaching. And then if that went well, I was going into this second one where I was going to systematize the thing, sell what I was doing privately on a weekly basis. And by private, I mean, I was doing weekly group calls and talking to each client every other week. Right? So I figured that the most I could handle of clients would be 150 clients. That would mean I'd talk to 75 people a week. Right. Because if I'm talking to everyone once every two weeks, right, uh, take the number in half. So and each coaching call is a half hour. Um, I didn't know whether we would sell any. So we did this cut to the front of the line pass. And the deal was like, look, I the I want to make sure because I hadn't said what the price was. I hadn't said what, how long the program was going to be. I didn't talk about any of those things. Right. I just was teaching, releasing reports. Uh, really kind of all free content and great content. And you're going to learn all about the coaching program. You've seen the success of my clients, right? You know, who have been coached by me. Um, and you're going to find out all about this coaching program uh, on the day that we go live. However, I want to make sure that the people who want this the most don't get boxed out. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, this was like in an email and it was, blog post, whatever, tomorrow at exactly noon, I'm going to send an email out. It will hit your email box at exactly noon. So you want to be at your email box at noon uh, if you want to get coached by me. Uh, in that email is going to be a link. That link is going to take you to a page, and that page is going to be the cut to the front of the line pass page. Uh, there will be 1,500 spots. Those 1,500 people who sign up on the cut to the front of the line pass page are going to get an hour's head start. They're going to get an advanced preview of the sales letter or the description of the, of the program, the price, everything else, an hour before everyone else. And that's important because it might be sold out by the time everyone else gets to see it. So it'll be 1,500 people can reserve that hour head start for the 150 spots that will exist. And so the email goes out the next day at exactly noon. Uh, and so all 35,000 people who had opted in in the last couple of weeks got that email at noon, right? A good portion of them clicked over to that page and that page was in Ajax, and it was a headline, couple bullet points, like three, so a few, not a couple. And then, uh, and then below that was a list that started with zero, right, but was quickly expanding where it had first name, last initial, 
and country where the person was from, right? And that was updating every few seconds, which meant that the list was getting longer as you're scrolling down the page, more names are being added. And the, the internet marketing world was a little bit of a smaller world than it is today. So the odds are is that you might even recognize, you might have some idea of who some of those people are. And so what most people told me was that they were frozen to that page. It took about an hour for that page to fill up, all 1,500 spots filled, right? And that was in a tremendous social proof convincer strategy that the next day, the 150 spots would be gone, right? It also told me that, okay, there's at least a bunch of people who are interested in this program, but it was clear, right? I ended up selling close to 200 because we took the page down when we had 150, but um, didn't even think about that there were already people on the page. So the page was cached on their computer. So just taking down the page meant nothing. And so we ended up selling 187, I think was the total. Um, yeah, like, uh, so I ended up having to coach 90 some odd people a week um, yeah, it was a lot of work, <laughs> but, um, but, but very, uh, but insane urgency for people. Uh, it's why I think we sold out in about an hour because those people all had those 1500 people had that head start, and, um, they also saw that how many people were trying to get that head start and they knew it was now or never, they probably would never get that opportunity because I made it clear that I wasn't planning on doing personal coaching ever again in a group format, um, which I might do now, but like I literally haven't done since. So it's been 14 years. Um, haven't done like a group coaching, private coaching component, part of a group coaching program. Uh, so, um, and I made that clear in the manifesto too, that this was, I was planning on this being my last time of coaching. And so the guy that you know, who's coached most of the gurus that you've seen kind of grow, uh, there's a big line of people who want to get coached by him. And this, oh, by the way, this is the very last time he plans on ever coaching anyone. You know, that creates a bunch of urgency. All right, what's the next one here? Missing piece, speed of money. Um, let's hold off on those. Let's go to you guys for a bit. Let me see, uh, where we're at. I can tell you that I'm hitting a little bit of a wall right now. Um, but let's see, maybe the questions will kind of mm. revive me. Um, all right, cool. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Here's a specific example. How would you start a semi high ticket, depending on your definition of high ticket, a new $5,000 coaching program without any testimonials or case studies? Um, I've answered similar questions like this before, Jason. Um, so I'll answer it now, but I won't go into the level of depth, uh, that it probably warrants or deserves. But if you ask me at another time, I'm willing to go deeper. Um, or you could probably go into the Facebook group and ask what I've said in the past. And I'm sure there would be people that would share with you what I've said. I'm going to give you the, the highlight part of it, but. I think other people could expand on it. And in case you're not in our Facebook group, it's free to join. Uh, and uh, it's not only free to join, it's free to remain a member. We're not. <laughs> um, but, uh, and in there, you can get a lot of stuff that I charge for elsewhere or just don't even make it available anymore. And it's there free. And there's a lot of heavy hitters in that group too. So if you're not a member, join. But uh, what I would do, sorry if I'm rocking, I'm on that thing that I told you about told not you Jason specifically about but told a bunch of people who are here uh, what I stand on to kind of stay in um, uh, stay in a place where I don't get tired and my legs don't lock and then I fall over so uh, I see that there's a follow-up here how would you sell the first one in beta per se this is a question regarding preemptive handling of objections okay so those were the next two things that Jason asked uh, Jason, the way I did it, and it's still the way I would do it is I would offer a, I would offer a guarantee that was strong enough to get a lot of people to apply for your program, um, because of the guarantee. And then I would do it by application. And then I would choose only the ones that I felt I could deliver on the applic deliver on the guarantee. 
So Jason, the way I did it, the very first time I sold coaching was, um, you are going to, by the time we're done, you are going to double the amount of money you're making now, and you're going to cut the number of hours you're working now in half, which means that you're going to forex, right? What you get from your business based on what you give it, because your time will be cut in half and your profits will be double at the least. And if it's not, you can ask, you can get a full refund, which means that if we, if I coach you for a year, uh, I get on the phone with you personally every two weeks coaching you. Um, if you don't have the result, then you get all the money back. All of it. We're not going to prorate it. We're not going to do anything. You just, if you're not making double and you're not working half as much, you're, I, then I will deem that a failure and I will give you your complete money back. So therefore, because of that, uh, at that time, right, um, that was a hard to pass up offer. Um, and so, and granted, I did this on stage and I did this on stage to people who knew I was partners with Jay Abraham and a bunch of other people. So it wasn't like I was some guy off the street. So they could, um, and you know, I'd like to believe that even to this day that I have a pretty clean reputation. Like I don't, um, I deliver on what I promise. Right. So anyway, um, so that got me 40 some odd people to apply and, uh, and I only chose the people who I felt I could actually deliver on that promise to. And so that would be the way that I would get around uh, your, you know, how to sell a high ticket product. Excuse me. A high ticket product um, without testimonials and stuff like that. Hopefully that helps you, Jason. Now, the reason I did it, it's like another one of those things that when I share it, I feel like I'm so smart for having done that, but I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because um, I, what happened was, is that, this is the first time I was ever going to pitch anything. The last thing I wanted to do was pitch something, have no one run to the back of the room and buy it. And I had no reason to think people would because it was like there were a lot of people who were going to be speaking on stage who that's what they did for a living. They sold on stage. And so totally didn't want to do that. So then I was like, well, if I do it by application, then no one has to know whether I succeeded or failed. And no one needs to, will figure out like how many people were interested or not interested. Right. So that felt good. And then it was like, okay, well, if I'm doing an application, um, what could get more people to put in an application if they're sitting on the fence? Well, certainly a guarantee, a strong guarantee would get maybe more people to, so that's how it kind of went. Hopefully that makes sense. Hey, Davey Paul, how you doing, my friend, my fellow uh, club kid from back in the days? Uh, my trauma is when I miss and live stream with Rich. Well, if that's the worst trauma that you have in your life, then I'm envious. Uh, I assume you're kidding. Uh, uh, Rich, what other sales formula besides pain, agitate, solution can I use? There is any other formula for problem aware, but that starts with benefit or interest driven without the need to start with pain or fear again for problem aware. There's like a thousand different uh, copywriting formulas. Did you ever even like type into Google? Like I remember, I think it was the, Oh, I can't do it right now. Cause I have everything off except, uh, this live stream. But, um, if you ask me that question next week, Giancarlo on Tuesday, I can certainly give you the answer. I have a lot of them. And I remember though, there being like a great blog post, um, either, on copy, it wasn't on copy blogger though. Uh, it might have been the other copy hackers or whatever. I don't remember the name of them. If I did, I would tell you them now. That listed pretty much like every copywriting formula, and there's literally thousands, well, uh, not thousands. Uh, there's close to like a hundred of them, and they're all different formats that you could follow. And so, if I were you, I would type in uh, copywriting formula copywriting template, um, you know, that's what, I, or I might type in, in quotes, uh, attention, interest, desire, action, right? Cause that's Aida. 
and then problem agitate solve both of those in quotes separately but in the same search box because now i'm looking for a page that has both of those in them and if i had a third off the top of my head i'd put a third one in uh generally that i do a lot of searches like that um for example right like i'm a big alfred adler fan uh he was you know a contemporary of freud's i'm a big nietzsche fan and I'm a big Heidegger fan. So a lot of times, like, well, not a lot of times, sometimes I will take three things that are kind of somewhat interrelated, but not really, but that I'm interested in. And I'll throw them into a search box and I'll be like, who the hell, who the hell else is interested in these three and has made some kind of connection between the work of these three. And a lot of times I find stuff that's like some of the best stuff that way, because I don't even know what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for a kindred spirit who also is, uh, maybe more writing inclined than I am, uh, who's thought about these three people or these five concepts or these things and brought them together. So I hope that helps Giancarlo. If it doesn't, just remind me and I will have access to more things on Tuesday just because I won't be fried. Uh, Jason, I have no idea why you're saying wow, but I'll take it because one of the things I learned as a guru is that if anything good happens around me, you take credit for it because that's what gurus do. Um, oh, you're talking about, yeah, okay, uh, the validation. Yeah, uh, must be great feeling and serious validation. It is and it was until you realize that people don't, they don't know you at all. And just as easily as they're saying nice things about you, the next day they could say something horrible about you. And fortunately for me, I never really had much of that, but I recognized that I appreciate it and it makes me feel good to know that my work makes a difference for people. Um, but I also realize that what really matters most are the people who know me best and what their opinion is of me, not people who've never met me and who could just as easily the next day say something totally horrible about me because once again, they don't know me. And yeah, so it was great and it did feel great. And then I kind of recognized that that is kind of, a superficial kind of thing to really get you that juiced about. But I would be lying if I didn't say that it did get me very juiced in the beginning. It certainly did. Um, Rich, can you do a reverse peg high price? I.e. before Mike started with Rich, he made two to 3% increase with the program X and five to six with program Y. And after he worked with Rich, he had a 56% increase, same or different. Well, Jason, this sounds to me like kind of what I was sharing earlier, not this time, maybe the previous time or maybe the time before that, where like I used to have testimonials in my BGS webinar that were just testimonials. And then I created more contrast in those testimonials by telling the story without the name. Right. So like when I introduced Mike Filsane, right, because Mike, I think the Mike Filsane testimonial from way back then was he went from 10 to 15 thousand dollars a month to like 300 thousand a month. So 20 X, right. Um, but like, you know, it's, it's, it says one thing like in the, you know, it means one thing. If you look at the testimony, like in my webinar and it's like, you know, well, who did I teach this to? I taught this to Mike Vilsain and here's what he had to say. I went from 10 to 15, right. To 300. Uh, it's powerful. I mean, shit, I worked hard to help him get that result. Um, but, um, but, you know, I'm going to share, I'll, I'll share this one other thing that uh, I thought was genius, but I hated it because it was done to me. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you that after. Uh, whereas like what I changed the webinar to was meet Mike, right? Like from the case studies of uh, former opportunity seekers, strategic profits, you know, next slide, uh, case file three, seven, nine, eight, four, uh, meet Mike. Mike was really struggling. He was working from home on some good months. He could bust out past $10,000, right? He even had a high one month of 15, but that was never consistent. And it was only a dream, right? Like I'm just, and then like, then the next slide is Mike's last name is Phil Sane. And here's what he had to say, right? It creates more of a contrast on the, um, 
on the testimonial. So I wouldn't say that's a reverse peg high price at all. That's not pegging price at all. That's more about results and contrast with results is always strong. So uh, let's see what Mark has to say, because maybe uh, Giancarlo, I don't want to steal just under here. Plus, I want to hear what he has to say. However, I've developed an alternative formula that works well. Happy to share uh, private message him. Or you could message it in public if you want to, uh, Mark. It's totally fine. I don't feel like you're taking anything away from me. Squeaky clean reputation, Rich. Well, I thank you. Uh, what is Google? <laughs> uh, funny. Uh, yeah, see, conflict claim closed. There's like feel, felt, found. There's a lot. Uh, that's my point. And there's like, I have some good lists of them, but uh, they're not, I can't even access them right now. Uh, let me get rid of this. Hold on. Stefan, good to see you, my friend. Rich, good to see you. I'm catching up on lives at 2X since currently I have no specific questions, but I had one before and didn't manage to ask you. What is your why? Like top three to five reasons that got you so successful at business, marketing, even college, in case it's the same why. Is it power, sex, running from pain, love of creating? Anyways, uh, and what are some cool test ways that you can do to find it in your experience uh, of course, since you are also doing coaching for entrepreneurs. Um, great question, Stefan. Um, in fact, uh, it's a challenge for me right now. And what I mean by that is, is that I, and I was just talking to someone about this earlier today, that a lot of my success was caused from running away from things, right? Like even to this day, I work out not to have a six pack, even though I've been fortunate to have it from time to time. Um, but more so I work out cause I don't want to be fat. I built a business so I wouldn't be poor. Um, I wasn't ever, I really was much more of a move away from person than a move towards person, which I think is not nearly as sustainable. Right. Because the problem with move away is it might be more powerful in the short run. I don't know. I, you know, um, but it certainly loses its power the further away you get from what you were trying to run away from. So um, that's a challenge. And um, and I'm in this weird place right now where I am not really clear now what's my why or what's my win? Uh, I don't, would I like to have more money? Sure. I'd like to have more money. Do I think my life is going to be any different with more money? Not at all. Uh, and no, and so there is no, like where I have to get to, and this is what I've been working on. And I wouldn't say I'm there yet, but to answer your question, Stefan, um, the Sartre has, I think it was called like his, your ultimate project. I, I don't remember what he called it, but it was a project. Uh, Alfred Adler also had a project there, you know, once psychology, once philosophy, but, and Kierkegaard, I think also did too. And if you were to blend them all together, which I feel, I feel like the right Institute does the best job of that is to your life should be about something and that something shouldn't be yourself because it has the least amount of power when it's about yourself, right? Cause then if you're doing things for selfish reasons, then your emotions can dictate things because if you're doing it for you and you don't feel like doing it, then why do it? Right? So that doesn't work. Um, so it has to be about others, right? And something I learned from Warner Earhart, not personally, like he didn't come over and teach it to me. <laughs> um, but stuff that I've read is, I did get to meet him once and that was kind of an honor, but um, was that uh, great people become great because they're committed to a cause bigger than themselves and that commitment to that cause pulls them into greatness and that we most of us make the mistake of looking at great people and thinking that they're different from us and they're not different from us. They were ordinary people that made a full commitment to something bigger than themselves that pulled, that needed them to be great and pulled them to greatness. And I believe in that. I totally do. I think there's so much truth to that. 
And so how do you get at that? And so one of the things I've been answering the question and exploring uh, this week, uh, so it's kind of funny that you're asking me this question, Stefan, is what is the best answer that I can come up with that I feel is true, right? That I would want to embody is if I were to die today, what would the world miss out on? What wouldn't happen because I wasn't here? And I think that question then opens up why I am here and what I'm supposed to do. But I have felt most alive in my life when I've been in pursuit of something and connected to a couple people. And so what I'm trying to understand about myself, and I think that like anyone who's interested in improving their own performance should think about, is when do I feel most alive? And what times in my life have I felt that? And what do those things have in common? And how do I replicate that? And so I don't have a great answer for you right now, Stefan, because I am struggling with what that answer is right now. And what I do know about myself is that if I can come up with that answer, um, my performance at work is like night and day it multiplies when I'm in pursuit of stuff it's a very different rich chef like what I feel inside and I don't know if that's I would imagine that's the case for many people um, but maybe they've never had that like maybe they've never wanted something so badly that they've pushed through like bad crap I know I have but a lot of but a lot of those I've realized were hedonic treadmill type things that they won't make a world like a goal achieved makes you happy when you achieve it and for another week or two. And then that's about it. So uh, David Brooks wrote this book called Second Mountain, which is all about like the second time around in your career, like how it needs to be about giving back, not about yourself, because it's just like you already have enough and you already know it's not going to make you any happier you know, once you get whatever you get, because that's just the way the world works. So, um, Stefan, I don't have a good answer. I am desperate to find that answer and I am debating which path I need to go down to figure out how to find that answer, whether I need to talk to a psychologist, whether I need to talk to a coach, whether I need, but, but I'm very much aware that right now specifically, that's why I'm thinking about this right now. My life would be a lot better if I had a clear idea of what my win is. What am I trying to achieve? What's really going to be like the thing that I could be like, yes. And it doesn't have to be something that gets done, right? It could be an aspiration of something that's big, so big, I can't even complete it. But, um, but yeah, you know, I feel much more alive, connected and in pursuit. And I don't know what I'm pursuing right now. And so it's, it's actually creating a drain um, from the standpoint of what I know, how I operate when I am engaged and in pursuit and feel alive versus like how I am right now. Uh, Rich, can you make a collaboration with Ty Lopez? You know, I never met Ty. I don't know him. Um, but Giancarlo, I'd be interested in why you would want me to do that. Um, I, I don't know, like, I don't know much about Ty, so I, I don't know whether he's a good guy or a bad guy. I don't know if he's sleazy or he keeps his nose clean. I've obviously seen his info, I, I've obviously seen his YouTube ads, and I've seen what, I've heard what he's doing now as far as buying the names or the web addresses of defunct businesses like Dress Barn, Pottery Barn, not Pottery Barn, uh, Pure One Imports and oh, Models. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that plays out, what he's doing there. Um, but I'm, I'd wonder why you'd want me to do that, Giancarlo. Um, uh, have hit the wall. You're the only one who can keep my attention for two hours. Well, good to know, Mark. Uh, how different was BGS from GPS? <laughs> uh, I just found a few binders full of the latter. Uh, very different. Very, very different. Are you making a joke? Because I said that most people were confused. I hope you were. Uh, happy to share publicly to you, Rich. Just a bit long to explain. Okay, so then he can contact you. Uh, Rich is the goat from marketing. Um, I'd like to be in the Hall of Fame. I don't know that I'm the goat. 
putting in testimonial videos is building up perceived value amazingly uh, before giving a price for the goat, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I want to share with you this thing that was done to me. Uh, if you practice altruism, it is for selfish reasons. It makes you feel good. Yeah, of course. Uh, not necessarily, at least in my experience, or opinion. I don't know who you were responding to, Stefan. Uh, ever since I saw you reading and journaling video and subsequent library of said journals and notes, curious if you were doing when you had the retail store or when it started like the serious note highlighting started. No, I've been keeping a journal since 1994. And I actually have some journal entries from even before then. So yes, yeah, I, I had a journal. Um, I've been keeping a journal forever. Um, I say that because I resonate with you more than anyone else in the marketplace. I wish I had heard of you before I actually did. I bought all this stuff with the mystery box uh, and stuff and literally just realized I had a year of SOW and other things and started grinding it out. Cool. And I hope you were well uh, pleased with what you got in that mystery box. I feel a lot of people are trying to find or are reevaluating their win. Always such great insight. Yeah, I would imagine a lot of people, especially nowadays, right, with what's going on in the world. So let me tell you uh, quickly before we call it a day what Eben Pagan did. And um, so uh, one thing that he did was kind of sleazy uh, was he reached out to me when he was just David D'Angelo and asked me if he could get it, if I would show him how I ran my business and how I did everything. And I said, sure. And then uh, he came to the second event that we ever did, the one that we did where we piped online. And uh, that was in 2007, and BGS was an 11-module course. And the reason why it was an 11-module course is because I, was, I had to get back to work for Agora in 12 weeks, and I said that right in the manifesto. Um, so the sleaze, that was the sleazy thing he did, because he did that knowing he was going to launch his own business course, which he did uh, like two or three months later. And lo and behold, it was an 11-module course, which why is uh, – my I broke my business building course up into 11 modules because – it was one a week, and in the 12th week, I had to get back to work for Agora. Uh, why he did it, I can only assume it was because I did it. And I didn't like the fact that he pretended he was in the dating niche while he was while I was sharing everything I had learned about the business building niche and then to find him as a competitor. So I thought that was really sleazy, and I thought it was uh, revealing of his character. However, um, so that's the sleazy part. Now let me tell you the genius part of what he did which I still to this day, I, I'm blown away at how smart it was. So when Eben first created Altitude, he invited all of us, all our, all the big gurus to Chicago where he put us up in a beautiful hotel and he did the training there and he asked for feedback and the feedback was horrible. Everyone ripped him apart. It was very academic at that time and everyone let him know that. But he did put us up in Chicago, showed us a good time, like did the training and so on the way out, he asked for testimonials. And, you know, most people are friendly. And if you ask a friend for a testimonial, a lot of times they give it. So he got testimonials from a lot of people who I worked very closely with and very hard closely with. So, you know, it's like Mike Filsane, right? One of my closest friends. And but back then he was a client and all that. Right. And I worked with Mike on the phone, coaching him for two years, like helping him get rid of the beliefs that were stopping him from being successful, helping him see different things and all this kind of stuff. And he paid me. I was his coach, right? Like, so I'm not, no complaint there. But I have a great testimonial from Mike Filsane. But when Mike Filsane gives a testimonial to Eben because he feels bad that he was at his event and, uh, you know, so he says, like, I'm sure I'll make a bunch of money from this event. It was great, right? The outside public, they don't know the difference. So all they see is that I have a testimonial from Mike Filsane, and he has a testimonial from Mike Filsane. I have a testimonial from Telman Knutson. He has a testimonial from Telman Knutson. I have a testimonial from Ryan Dice. He has a testimonial. The only difference was is that I actually coached all those people, and he just did an event, and people felt bad, and they were friendly, so they gave him a nice little testimonial. But to the outside world, it was the same thing. And so to this day, I give Eben crazy props because I didn't like it because like I was on the receiving end of that. But 
in any other market at any other time, if anyone had done that, I would have thought that that was absolutely genius. So props to Eben on that. For shame on Eben on the first part that I mentioned. But uh, what a powerful, powerful equalizer, right? Like uh, he certainly made the world think that he had been coaching a lot of people that he wasn't. And, I, and I've gone through Altitude, and I think it's a great course. So I, I, I think Evan's always put great courses together. He reads a lot of the same books I do. I think we think in certain ways similar, in other ways very different. But uh, he's got a good mind for sure, and I don't have anything negative to say about him except that first part of what he did because I think that was sleazy, and I think he knew what he was doing. And I wouldn't do that. If I was sitting down with someone and I was about to get into a business and they are in that business and they were about to talk to me as if I wasn't in that business because I'm not in that moment, but I knew I was going to get in, I'd be like, hey, you know what? Before you say anything, I want you to know I'm getting into this business. And so you might not want to share anything that you hold secret because the last thing I would want you to do is think that I'm prying you for information to, you know, in a devious way. And that's what was done to me. So whatever. Anyway, uh, let's answer these last few. Then I'm going to hit the road. I'm tired. And uh, let's see. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I'd love to hear what Stefan says because maybe he has some advice for me. So um, let's see. I've gotten that. I've gotten in that in pursuit mode before and literally for months I'd be able to do so much work and feel like I'm flying and having that holiday like feel constantly and really resonate with those Eminem songs, lose yourself till I collapse. He talks about that state. I loved what would the world miss out on question. Another one of the first principles I go by is what makes my character greater. You know, those things you do and you feel lesser and there are those you do and you feel bigger, expansive and strong. Uh huh. I use that as a compass as well, but I'm still looking for that super powerful why that will guide me at least for 10 or 20 years, but maybe it's a fool's game. I don't think it's a fool's game. Uh, Grant Cardone also got rich because of running away from poverty and pain. He keeps, and he keeps connected to that daily. I don't think that's a good way to live though. Uh, Dwayne Johnson does that also. Um, they keep that pain strong and alive in their mind. I look, you know, it's hard to argue with it if it's working for them. I don't think being fear-based is the way to go long-term um, because it's, yeah, you're motivated, but you're motivated by fear. You're running away from something. You're, so your day-to-day -day is like, I never felt anxiety, but that's because I'm disconnected with my body, but, but it would be, right? So that's one. And then the other thing, though, is, um, yeah, it's, it's selfish, too. It's, it's a selfish kind of thing, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it certainly isn't selfless running away, right, like from anything. Um, so there's that. But the, you know, what I would say is is that, um, let me just look at what you said for that. That, that in pursuit thing is everything to me. And, uh, and I evaluate goals like, based on that like does it get me up in the morning because if it doesn't there's no purpose of the goal because it's not going to once i achieve that goal i don't really think much is going to change i'll be happy for a week or two so um you know another way like it, it's taking on a challenge or a problem or like setting a goal that like that's a worldwide problem a worldwide goal you know so if i'm going to go down that road and you know, then it's like really, really looking at what are the biggest problems in entrepreneurship and what do I want to take on as like I am going to solve that this by the time I pass away, this problem will no longer be a problem. It will be something that people will have to tell other people about that it once was a problem. Uh, and. But it's got to grab you. I don't think you can. I think you got to explore it. You got to come up with it. You got to like kind of like sift for gold through your personality, through your desires, through all these things. Um, but you don't decide, right? Like it's not as simple as a decision, just like it's not as like to believe one thing versus another is not as simple as a decision. Um, so uh, I'll keep you posted. Uh, it is a it's very front. Uh, it's very front. It's it's very in front of me right now. Um, it's very in front of me right now. 
as someone who has taken years off because didn't feel like working and felt like I'd achieved what I wanted to, um, it is incredible. Like it's incredibly important for me to have a reason why. And, uh, and I have bought into the idea that the reason why has to be bigger than me now. It has to be way bigger than me. And it's that, so it's really just about figuring out what it is. What, what is that why that for me, I'd be willing to do more for that than I'd be willing to do for myself? What is, what is that thing that I'm willing to commit to to such a high level it won't matter like how I feel or what else is going on? or anything else. And uh, I don't have that answer, but I want to find that answer. And I believe it's there. And I think it can be for most people if they sift through enough crap. Uh, Rich, it is normal to be obsessed about marketing and sales? The other day I had a dream I was on the stage talking. Yeah, it's pretty common. Uh, it's pretty common, Giancarlo. And as long as you work on your skills and try and develop your own stuff so that you have stuff to share that isn't just parroted. Um, yeah, it's fulfilling and it is kind of cool for a while. And I certainly enjoy the respect I have in this, pl in this marketplace and the ability to get people on the phone and stuff. So yeah. Uh, and I love teaching too. And I like talking on stage as well. Um, when I'm making an impact, so I don't have, uh, it's common though. It's very common. Uh, very, very much. I've never taken anyone up on a thing like that, but it just resonated with me and I just one I could trust. Uh, I'm not sure I lost the thread here. John, come on. Oh, uh, what you resonate with. Got it. Well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Uh, Rich, are ebook downloads still effective for B2B? Struggling to come up with an effective marketing campaign, how would you go about or begin thinking about a strategic campaign for building up a B2B business? Well, you know, another word for an ebook is a white paper, and white papers are still out there. Uh, it really depends on who the market is and what you're trying to target. But if you show up on a future live stream and you kind of present the scenario to me in the comments, I'll give you my best answer, Mario. I can't do it tonight because I'm already late, but, uh, well, I'm not late for anything. I'm just. It's, it would take too long to do that now, but I'd certainly be willing to give you my best advice next time. Uh, the old guilty by association trick, haha. Uh, then it is a Mac. Damn, Mac I've been making this a Machiavellian dream. Yeah, it was kind of Machiavellian. Uh, do you still need someone to edit your videos? I'm a diehard fan. If you're a video editor, then yes. We need to talk uh, like videos like this. Like I recognize that from my own viewing habits, right? Like if I go to YouTube, it's not very often I want to watch a two hour video and you know, even a Joe Rogan one, like I might put it on in the background and that's it. Like, um, so, but I just assume that in like this two hours that we just spent together, there's probably a few five minute clips that are damn good, right? Much better than the whole two hours. And I'd love to be able to put those out to Facebook, to YouTube. Um, I think it would be so much more effective than, than just putting this out, right? And then also, the other reason is, Jaden, that this would then serve a much bigger business purpose for my business because then like, uh, Matt wouldn't have to work so hard with our emails. Like we could be sending out videos from time to time, right? Like we could be using this content in so many other ways. I could be posting it to, uh, IGTV. Like I could be doing like my company could be doing so much if we could take this raw material that I do twice a week and get mileage out of it. And if we got mileage out of it, then I would also prepare more for these right now. I just kind of show up. I kind of think about what I'm going to talk about, but that's about it. Um, so this is rich off the cuff for the most. And I think most of you know that I, I, I hope you guys know that. Um, but I would actually spend a bunch of time preparing if I could actually get mileage out of these. Not that like, I don't, I appreciate each and every one of you guys that are here. That's why I do this. Right. But, um, but I have a, you know, I have a life to run. I have kids. I have a business. I have a girlfriend. I have all this stuff. Um, so for me to take these four hours in and of itself is a lot, 
to dedicate more time to it, I got to like get more out of it. I don't expect you guys to give me anything more. It's on me, uh, but that's why I need to find an editor that will take these, cut them up and uh, figure out what's good, what's not like that kind of stuff. And if I can find someone like that, that would be great. So Jaden, if that's you, hit me up. Even if that's not you, let me know. So I don't hold out hopes that it's you. You can always uh, message me through Facebook or if you're a member of the group, which hopefully you are, and it's just the name of the group is Strategic Profits, you could always put a thing out there, like in the group, and I will answer, um, etc. Let's make a uh, an event, Rich, Eb and Rich Fight Eben, and then the earnings, we donate it. Uh, Unless he's taken a lot of jujitsu that I don't know about. Um, I think I outweigh him by like 80 pounds. Uh, he's a pretty thin guy. And I think he's a vegetarian too, which makes him even smaller. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Although I did, you know, I have reached out to him. I've reached out to him several times. When he moved to New York, when I was living in New York, I was like, you know, I said, hey, now that you live here, like if you ever want to get together, he never responded. Uh, then he moved down to Miami. I think he still lives in Miami. I don't know. Um, and I sent, I reached out to him again. I have his email and his phone number. Um, didn't call him. Wouldn't want to be intrusive, but, uh, never responded. I figured like, look, let bygones be bygones. I don't really care. And he is very smart. And, uh, you know, I like smart people and he'd be another good person to talk to from time to time and be like, what are you reading? What, here's what I'm reading. Here's what I've learned. Here's what you've learned. Uh, so, uh. Yeah, I don't have any animosity towards him. Not like uh, Mr. HK. Um, you've got a daughter to call. True that. Uh, no rules hold. Uh, Fear-based living eventually takes its toll on your neurochemistry. That's what I think. Christopher Eben married an ugly woman years later. Maybe it was Carmen. Uh, let's not be mean to that. And his, his so, there's so much more than just looks, right? Um, you know, hopefully he's married to a wonderful woman. Uh, in my mastermind today, a guy named Shafrin talked about the billionaire code, his answer for the pursuit things for entrepreneurs. Uh, is it Alex Shafrin? Because Alex Shafrin, from what I gather, has a pretty good course on scaling. Um, curious, Chris, if that's who you're talking about. Uh, I think what we constantly chase is growth, and they say what's not growing is dying. Yeah, we grow, but the question is, you will grow in pursuit of anything. The question is, is what do you want to dedicate your life to? And, you know, my girlfriend who's retired now, but who used to manage work with the uber, 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 uber wealthy, like, you know, billionaires and above, like at, she was number two at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Um... You know, there are people that are her clients that are multi-billionaires that don't have enough time to get their knee fixed and they're 70 or 80 and they're in pain with their knee because they need to make their next 10 million or 100 million. And it's like, that's insane. Um, so, yeah, I just, we'll see. Uh, I'm excited to see the promo presentation you mentioned earlier one day. Today was awesome. Oh, okay, cool. Next comes contribution. That's what has to come, which is what I think you are searching for. That is what I'm searching for. But I'm searching for a contribution that I uniquely am capable of doing, that no one else could do. Um, based on, not because of who I am, just based on my life experience, what I can do, who I can help, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm super thankful for you taking the time to educate us. Well, thank you, April, and I appreciate you saying that. Hey, Rich, you should read an obstacle to your success by Rich Shefford. It could help with you finding that bigger why. Uh, Touche. Uh, is that what Start With Why by Simon Simic says? Um, uh, thanks, Rich. Awesome time with you as always. Thanks, Mark. Uh, amazingly energetic broadcast for somebody who declared that he was fried. Thank you for this today. Uh, well, thank you, Christopher. Yeah, you'll get plenty of golden snippets from these lives. Yeah, that's my hope. Um, off the cuff is really great stuff. Edit your profile pic first, LOL. Which profile pic? Uh, with my daughters? Even though, like, they're obviously a lot older now. Um, 
I got a new video editing setup recently. I could cut up the videos as I'm catching up on them and maybe add an intro or description. Where would I send these if I made a few? Um, Stefan, uh, message me and, um, or send me a friend request or something. I would love you to do that. Even if you didn't do them well, because even small videos that I could throw out there, even just to the Facebook group, like, you know, not many people can avail themselves and be on here for two hours. Sorry. I just stuck gum in my mouth. I'm just, I'm getting ready to end. Um, and if you did a great job, then I would owe you a favor. I'd owe you a favor anyway. And I'm good at paying back favors. Um, Evan's pretty lethal with his words though, but my money is on you. Rich. Yeah, I think I could take him in a fight, but I think um, intellectually we're probably on the same plane. I like Evan and his stuff. So do I. I have nothing bad to say about him. I have a bunch of his courses. Both of you are quite intellectual in your content. Yeah, and we've read a lot of the same stuff. We like a lot of the same things. In a different life, we could have been best of friends. But that's why I reached out to him a couple times because, like, yeah, the past is the past, man. And I can't blame him for being smart and taking my testimonials and making it seem like he did the same. So, um, yeah, I'd like to be friends with him. I mean, at the end of the day, is there really anyone that you don't want to be friends with? I would choose not to be friends with that other person that we talked about in the other live stream. But that's more based on his character. Not on anything he's done to me. And anyone that's done anything to me, my natural default, like I was saying at the very beginning of this live stream, like what my psychologist said, you don't need cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I generally recognize that most people who do things that hurt you uh, are not someone who's just doing things to hurt you. They think what they're doing is right for themselves. There is evil in the world, but we don't come across that very often. And so most of the time... It's just a difference of perspective, and obviously, you know, I take my perspective, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's my thought. Uh, Rich, I only got the second half of today, but thanks again. Uh, I'm putting my creating my framework. I'm putting off creating my framework and distilling everything down and staying connected to something bigger to create from all. That's part of my vision and purpose. It's a daunting. Ta it sounds like a daunting task. Uh, that and following soul, not systems, to create systems come after, surrendering to it all. Uh, love your lives, Rich. Well, thank you, Denise. Uh, thanks, Rich. Always great bouncing ideas with your mind. Hey, do me some videos, cut them up, and if you want to get, like, and then you tell me what you think is fair, like how much time you and I just getting on a Zoom call or talking or anything else I can do for you, uh, let me know. Uh, thanks for tonight. You're welcome. The guy that wants to work for you. Um, what was the other guy? That's Jaden. Jaden, if you are looking for a job though, Stefan, I'd still love you to do it. Even if you don't like, even if you just do a few, uh, cause you might create one and I might like the way it's done. And then I could show that to Jaden or someone else. So, um, all right. Uh, this was great tonight. I have something I need to ask, but on only two hours sleep, I'm tabling it for another time. Cool. Well, I'll be here. Uh, I don't know about that, Gene Carlos, so I don't want to say that. Uh, let me know when the Florida meetup is. I'm driving down to get out of the cold. All right. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like we need to have a get together. I think you would enjoy a conversation with Travis Sago. Yeah, that actually, were you the person that said... Were you the one that said last time that I need to eat, to to interview him, or was that someone else? Because now, if it was you, okay, that's cool. If it wasn't, then I'm getting like confirmation from the universe. I need to reach out to him. Rich, my other let's see, okay, uh, Rich, my one of my other mentors is a global leader in sustainable happiness. She might be able to help you find your new why. It's kind of her thing. Would be psyched to make a connect for you. Dan, I would be very interested in that. I'd be very interested in that. In fact, um, 
the times where I've made the most amount of growth in my life, um, believe it or not, I don't know if the person that this global leader in the sustainable happiness movement is older than 50. Um, doesn't have to be, obviously. But the times of my life where I've made the most amount of progress is when I've had a, a coaching relationship with a female that was older than me who believed in me more than I believed in myself. And that was consistent with the hypnotist that like I first got hypnotized from. Uh, that was consistent with Nancy Rady, um, who is John Rady's wife, um, Dr. John Rady, the professor at Harvard Med School, who was my doctor for a little while, the guy that wrote the book with Ed Hallowell, Driven to Distraction. Nancy wrote uh, The Disorganized Mind, and she believed in me at a time when I didn't believe in myself, and that made a world of difference. Um, I think that has to do with the fact that, well, I don't need to give you more of my personal life stuff right now, but, um, but yeah, so Dan, I would be all over that. And uh, it wasn't you. Okay, uh, but you should interview him. Okay, I will make, I, it's on my board because someone mentioned it last week, um, but I'll make another note. And so before I say goodbye to everyone, uh, okay, cool. Well, I know, uh, cool. If I see here that uh, Giancarlo says that Justin Brooke worked with him he knows how to reach him directly. Cool. All right. Actually, I just reached out to Justin today. Justin used to work for me years ago. So, um, uh, actually, I'm looking forward to catching up with him. Um, really, I have some training from his. Uh, what's the best way to do that, Rich? I'll do that for you, Rich. Um, same thing. Message me in Facebook. If you have a problem messaging me in Facebook, then um, just go into the group and put a post. Hey, Rich, Dan Fishman here. Uh, I offered to put you in touch with that person for the happiness movement. Uh, please respond here. And the reason I do that is not because I'm so protective about my email address. It's just that I don't go into my email box every day. And right now, there are so many email messages I'm trying to plug away and so I don't there's no benefit of giving anyone my email address. In fact, most of my friends know if they send me an email, they got to text me to let me know to look in my email box. And obviously, I don't want to give my cell phone out just publicly because, you know, who knows who, who decides they want to call me at crazy hours. Not any of you, but then it's out there and these videos get watched quite a bit over time. So, uh, um, so anyway, um, Let's Clint Gray catching up with Frank Kern would always be fun. He has a great sense of humor and a great info. Yeah. Um, Frank's another guy that just disappeared. Uh, Frank and Evan used to work together and, um, and that might be why I don't hear from either one of them. They both live in Miami now. Um, I've reached out to Frank a few times too, since he moved to Miami. And um, he's never responded. So, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe I did something to offend Frank. I don't think I did. Um, I've helped him with his business at times. Um, who knows? Um, last time I saw him, I think we went over his house and we hung out. So I don't know. Maybe he's just trying to keep distance from the world. I feel bad for Frank because he always seems to get in bed with people, not figuratively. Uh, well, figuratively, not literally to bet in bed with people that seemed to not be the right people for him to get into bed with. So it was Grant Cardone this last time. Before that, it was Jordan Belford. Um, interesting who he chooses. And it seems like it always bites him in the ass. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, can I invite Eugene Schwartz? No, I cannot invite Eugene Schwartz. He's dead. And the... I used to be friendly with a French gentleman um, who's also a uh, Christian Godfrey. He's passed away, but he used to be his French partner. They did a lot of deals together, him and Eugene Schwartz. And Christian Godfrey was the person who trans 
translated the Internet Business Manifesto into French for me because he wanted to start up a strategic profits in France. So, uh, and then he passed away. Um, anyway, guys, I should say good night. It's been two and a half hours. I love the fact that you guys are here. I feel like I'm talking to each and every one of you. I hope you feel that way too. Um, you know, I'm an introvert. And as an introvert, I don't have as many people to talk to in my life as I probably would like to. And then in COVID and stuff like that, you know, even though I'm an introvert, when I stay at hotels, I always go down to the lobby to do my work because there's like an energy with people that I don't feel like I have when I'm sitting alone in a hotel room or sitting here alone in my office. And uh, it's another reason why, like, I can't wait to have an, an assistant slash right-hand person that's here because I just, I do so much better with another witness in the room around me than in a vacuum. And, you know, for the last X number of months, that's what you guys have been for me, that you've been here to listen to what I have to share and are willing to ask me questions. So, and I appreciate each and every one of you for doing that. I would, my weeks would be a lot less pleasant without these four hours. Um, so it's really nice and it's really kind of uh, heartwarming that I can, fortunately, I guess for me that I've been doing this long enough that I can just show up on these with like a picture of a whiteboard from eight years ago and spend two hours plus on just like a small part of it and have you guys happy that I did. So thank you uh, once again to all of you for whether you commented, emoted or shared or just lurked. Um, it means a lot to me and I appreciate it. And so if I for those of you who, who I don't see on Tuesday, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving if you live in the U.S., and if you don't live in the U.S., I hope that you still have a very wonderful Thursday, even though it won't be your Thanksgiving. I will do my very best to turn on my live stream during the day at some point on Thursday or turn on my phone. Um, probably won't be as long or as content rich, but I certainly will do it. And I will be doing another live stream on Tuesday, so check it out. And for those of you who I said, yeah, reach out to me in the group. I meant it. Please do. Uh, Stefan. Um, Dan Fishman and the other gentleman or woman, I can't tell because the screen is black, Jaden Camus. Uh, so, yep. So anyway, so thank you all. And um, I am busy right now on the next DLR Winners interviews. I will be in Orlando for Maxwell Finn's Mastermind on the 9th and 10th. And uh, I think that's the only traveling I'm doing. And so I will talk to everyone Tuesday from 2 to 4 p.m. to Higher Profits and Beyond. Rich Sheffern, over and out.